Welcome everybody to episode six of Tales from the Tackle Shop. This might be quite a short podcast tonight. We've been talking about ghosts and ghouls mm. and Alex wants to go home now. Yeah. A bit scared. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Get it over and out of the way. Yeah. It's just a Halloween special, is it? We've missed it, but it could be. Oh. Yeah. Real life ghost stories in the old pub. Ooh. Mm. Spooky. Right, okay, so episode six, with loads to talk about this week. Obviously, fantastic match yesterday on the old course of the Neen. Unreal match, really, mate, yeah. Unreal. Smashed all the records? Yeah, n- another record this year, and yeah, just awesome, mate, really. Awesome. Cool. We'll, we'll get onto that in a minute, and we're going to get a lowdown of how you fished as well, because, um, yeah, what your section? Yeah, about time, yeah. Yeah, and... It, Great team performance. Yeah, we had five section wins. So first five people that the board's up, we had four section wins. I was like, oh, this is looking good. Um, but yeah, we'll come to that later, I suppose. Yeah, really good stuff. I saw the results. I saw John Taylor's Facebook page and he started to touch on it and he said, I think Tackle and Bates have done really well. Yeah, it was very close. I yeah. mean, as always with that league... It, it, I mean, I think the sections we won image were probably second in them, so it's it's real tight league, and we knew it was going to be close, whatever. I won't burst your bubble because obviously I know the points because I looked at them, but we'll yeah, we'll yeah. get into that in depth. Right, I just want to kick this off. I just want to mention a couple of things about the Fenland Guardian scheme. Don't wish to bore people, but we've had quite a few things happen this week, as we have every week. We had a couple of incidents. One of them was sadly involving a dog that appeared to roll on i think it was two fish heads i think they were pike heads that still had hooks in them and talking to the dog owner i think what's happened is uh, an individual has caught fish for the pot chopped the heads of the pike off obviously shoved the carcasses in a bag and however they've caught these fish whether it be deadline whatever have left the hooks in the Mm -hmm. pike heads and this poor dog has found them rolled on them and needed a trip to the vets to get the hooks out. So that happened last Wednesday. Um, we saw this incident on, believe it or not, March free discussion page. I'm not yeah. on there, but we got wind of it. Shot down to have a look. Got one of the the guys who's helping out with March and District Bader thing at the minute, John Watson, he shot down there as well. We couldn't find anything left. And while I was there, the enforcement officer turned up. So we had a good old look down there, but found nothing. But... um. Yeah, that wasn't great. So we, I think it was important that we attended. But while we were there, the, the amount of fly tipping down there is... Yeah, it's been um, a hot spot, isn't it? Unbelievable. I think just past the sewage works, there's a sofa, a hoover. Looks like someone's done a house clearance. Mm-hmm. And it is horrendous. And um, They go right to the bottom as well, don't they? Yeah. That's where we found the fish traps. Is it? Yeah, right past the sewage works where the, the grass gets long and the reeds start. Mm. And... Uh, They've been hiding in there and doing all sorts. So we've been in touch with middle-level commissioners this week and mentioned the scheme to them. They're really on board with the scheme, which is great, and there's yeah. more of that to come. But while I was talking to them about the scheme, I asked them for a favour, so I, I emailed them. I said, look, if we pick up the rubbish on the bank, can you guys organise with FTC to get the fly tip litter picked up? Mm-hmm. Litter's a bit of a weak word for that, isn't it, I suppose? But it, that's what it is. So they said, yeah, no problem. They're going to liaise with FDC, so that's really good. So once that happens, I'll let everybody know. So that's, that's a really good partnership already mm-hmm. with the middle-level commissioners. And while I was at it, I thought the Anglian Trust have started off a scheme, um, Anglers Against Litter. Right. So I emailed them, and I said, look, we've got this Fenland and Guardian scheme. Um, do you want to collaborate with us? Because we can set up all these litter picks like we were going to do last yeah. shot on the river mm-hmm. out here. Mm-hmm. And gave them the opp- I've given them the opportunity of joining us, basically. Yeah. I've cheekily asked for funding. Right. Well, because I spent 70 quid yesterday getting more flyers printed off. These yeah. things aren't done for free. Yeah. You know, and uh, the, f- we've, the first thousand we had done Kingsley and Angling Club paid for them. Yeah. I paid for the second thousand. So that's 2,000 lots of flyers and business cards mm. we've got. And it, it costs money. So, yeah, I'm going to say, look, cl- collaborate with yeah. us. Come on board with the litter pick and everything that we do, and um, we'll see where we go. So that'll be interesting to see what response we get for the Angling Trust. 
Um, finally, from the Fenland Guardian scheme, I'd just like to thank Ash Brown. Uh, he's the guy who is the secretary for Kings Lynn Angling Association, and he helps me run the scheme. Mm-hmm. And beginning of last week, Norfolk Constabulary got in touch with him, and they arranged a meeting at uh, down a market police station, and it was the RK unit, and they had a chat with Ash about the scheme. So Norfolk RCAT are completely on board with it. Brilliant. I think it's a really good idea, really up to speed with it all. To the extent that if we find nets, deadlines, they're quite happy to come down and take DNA off them right. to try and catch the individuals. That's, that's how much they want to get involved. So I think that's incredible, isn't it? We've got CAMS, Norfolk RCAT units. Uh, the Environment Agency Enforcement Officers are on board with it. Middle Level Commissioners are on board with it. It's just picking up pace so Mm. that's going to be a really really good thing and i think over the next few months it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger so it was um lots of positives apart from the fish head incident yeah um oh yeah sorry i lied one more thing um the pike anglers club of great britain also put an article in their monthly um i think it's every three or four months they have a journal come out so we got a article in there as well so that will go out nationally so that explains the scheme in in a lot of detail so that's another thing that we've done this week so all guns blazing okay let's get on to something else now last week we had tom moyer on and i asked people for a bit of feedback of how they felt the the setup went with the guest on on a separate podcast just to give you some idea, we've had quite a lot of listeners to myself and Alex midweek. Um, we're getting towards 500. And so thank you for that for everybody. And the Tom Moyer podcast is getting towards 300. So obviously a little bit less, but still pretty healthy figures. But what we would really like is to get some feedback from people. So we need to know from listeners whether they think that setup's good or not, because obviously we can adjust things as we go. Now, one good way of doing this, you can comment through the YouTube channel. And Alex, I have a question for you. This is from a gentleman called Michael Gray. So he sent this in a couple of days ago. So rather than me message you, I thought we'd save it for the podcast. Okay, I'll read it out to you. A question for Alex. If using a rake on a river swim, so I'll say that again. If using a rake on a river swim to help clear weed, how long should you leave it to settle before starting to fish it? Well, obviously it depends on what situation. Um, in a match situation, you have a time limit that you can rake it up to. Um, so in my eyes, in a match situation, you want to rake it as quick as you can for the swim to clear, especially on a river. You, if other people are doing it as well, you want all the <clears throat> excess weed and stuff to get out of your swim. Um, did you rake it the weekend? I did, yeah. So give us that analogy then. What was the time constraints on um, that? So basically you're allowed at your peg from May to clock and you you can't chuck a rake in after nine o'clock. Right. So you've got an hour window to rake it if you want. Um, so I've chucked the rake in about five or six times, um, maybe a little bit more, and it didn't need no more than that. It felt quite clean. Um, most of the weed that I got off was on that far shelf sort of thing not very wide there so um you could reach quite tight over um we're raking to so we can get a rig through or a rig near the bottom as possible to try and catch a bigger stamp of fish if you were pleasure fishing for example then you normally normally if i was going pleasure fishing say on the 20 foot or whatever and i'm raking it i'm not raking it i'm cutting the weed it's cabbages eel grass there's a bit of cot you know, I've got these big rakes that we have that seems to do the job. Um, normally, I'll rake it probably night before. And then next night, I'll go down and pre-bait it. So I'm not raking it to have an effect to sort of stir the bottom up as such. I'm just raking it so I can get a nice clean bottom and not have to worry about snags and stuff like that. But if you just go in in the morning and rake in, first thing you do is rake it. Um Obviously, you don't want to get all your gear out, really. Chuck a rake in and trash it all because you've got weed and rakes everywhere and smash all your gear to bits. But it's one of them. It's all about confidence as well. Some people don't agree with raking and other people's 
they'll if it's allowed they'll rake it. But, do, um, do you find the the warmer the weather, the more effective the raking? Yes, yeah, I think. So in the summer, raking in the summer fun, raking yeah. is a big thing because the water's generally clearer. It just stirs that bottom up, and the fish do home in on it. Um, yeah. So. I think raking's more of a summer thing, definitely. Obviously, in the winter, most of the time, the weeds died off, so you don't have to worry about it. But this time of year now, the weed's dying off, but it's still there. We haven't had enough rain for it to wash out of the system, and the boats haven't sort of churned it up as such yet. So, um, yeah, it probably is different types of weed as well. Yeah. Um, I think the answer is, it depends on the time of year. Oh, without a doubt. And it what, depends... What, what weed you've got in what your peg and what you're trying peg, to do yeah. so um bennick for example is more sort of that cot weed like it's like jelly isn't it it's like yeah um it, you can rake it and then a the boat will go through and it just wobbles and moves all over the place whereas at march it's proper weed so it's cabbages eel grass that basically stops you from getting a rig to the bottom whereas bennick for example the cot just sits on the bottom and creates sort of a so, false layer. So in some situations, you need to rake to enable you to fish the swim properly. Yes. And in other situations, you want to rake the swim to activate it. Yeah. And in Utopia, you want to do both. Yeah. But I think that's more applicable for the warmer weather, isn't it? Yeah. Particularly the activation. Yeah. Because you've got tension bream that will home in on it straight away. Mm -hmm. In my experience, I don't think raking puts the fish off. No. No. At all. No. No. I think it's uh, it puts the angler off. It can do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I say, it's one of them. Yeah. Everyone has their own uh, ideas on it. So I think that's a really good um, way of asking questions to us. If people send questions in via yeah. uh, YouTube or Messenger, because what I've been doing is actually e messaging them back individually, but we'll save it for the, the next podcast. Yeah. So it'd be quite cool to have a little Q&A session if we mm -hmm. can get enough people to ask questions. So, Michael, thank you for sending that in. That's a, that was a really good question and not a straightforward answer. Cool. Right. Can I have a bit of a whinge about Facebook groups? <laughs> what? Nothing. You're funny. <laughs> Why am I funny? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I am. I'm just... <sighs> right. Do you remember last year we got actually, we didn't get banned from a Facebook group, but I, we nearly got banned. Well, I, I nearly got banned. Right. Yeah, because I didn't understand Facebook etiquette. Right. I just thought we can, if you're part of a group, just stick on. Yeah. But, so I'll stick in stuff like the podcast. Apparently I infringed some high-powered law within Facebook land and it wasn't right. allowed. So I thought, oh, really? So what I've been doing, every time I join a group, which I think might be useful for, for promoting the podcast... I then spend what seems like hours finding out who the admins are for these groups, sending them personal messages and asking them if it's okay to post things on about the podcast. And every time I've done this, everybody said, yep, no problem. Uh, they've normally said, but don't overdo it. Mm. So here we go. So last week we had Tom Moyer on doing the finesselers. And I thought, oh, there's a, a few groups which I think really appeal to the people that go on those groups. So I put... Um, I shared the podcast Perch Zone. Uh-uh. Got blocked. Right. Apparently I'm advertising. I'm thinking, I don't believe this. I've even asked their permission. And then the not-so-friendly fishing community blocked us as well. Oh. Which I just thought, this is crazy. Why have these Facebook groups? I've actually, I feel like a school kid, asked permission to post the podcast of which I did a couple of weeks ago, which wasn't a problem. And lo and behold, no, not allowed to. Slap wrist. So I don't get it. Mm. I just think some of these groups are set up for people's own personal gain. And uh, once they get to a certain size, they they think they can rule the roof. So a bit disappointed with that, really, because if people could see how much time we spend with these podcasts and our own personal money to do them, we do it because we enjoy doing it. And it's just to promote fishing. We don't actually gain anything financially out of it. And then for someone to turn around and go, you're advertising. Mm -hmm. I just think, oh, dear, really? Anyway, whinge over. You happy I, now? I've got oh, a, bit, a bit of therapy. Yeah. I've got it off my chest. Yeah, I feel like we can... Um, Move on. I, I can face the rest of the day. 
<laughs> you don't care, do you? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. well, I'm glad I amuse you. Yeah. Yeah. You're like an old man, aren't you? Oh, I am an old... Have I told you about my back? I've been to the physio again today. Right. I'm going to get the ice pack out again in a minute. I must be that much of a highly tuned athlete that I don't, I've done something to my back casting, these, these lures. Amazing. Should I tell you what it is? It's your rod that was God knows how many years old and the reel that went out of date about 25 years ago. This is new Need stuff. New gear, this is new stuff, ultra light. I'll tell you what it is. I'm put, putting so much power. Yeah. Like, I'm loading the rod that much with my humongous biceps yeah. and big back muscles that I've actually torn a muscle off the bone. Really? Yeah. That's beast mode, isn't it? Or maybe yeah, it's just... Yeah, but if you, if you don't catch anything... Maybe sport. I'm just old and fat. I don't know what it is. But this is causing me problems. I've had... Or too much fishing, maybe. I've been twice in the last two weeks. Really? Yeah. Guess what I've caught? Nothing. I caught a pike about three pound. I told you about the bream I found looked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had two of them. The smallest one was nine pound. Mm-hmm. And I blanked last time I went. Yeah, I've got to lift my game. Not very good at all. Anyway, people don't want to hear about my woes. Yeah, though, pike really is it? It doesn't feel right yet. No, no. It doesn't feel like winter, winter, does it? I went bait fishing last week, and I sat there and I thought, it's still too warm. Still too warm. Yeah. It was just I didn't. It wasn't until I've got icicles dripping off my nose. It's not quite right, and you know I see like a, a couple of Eskimos and a bear and a penguin. It's not cold enough. So, I don't know, loads of match results, getting quite a few new clubs as well, messaging me and obviously yourself. Um, so that's good. Um, I reckon we should start with probably Tid. Oh, uh, I've got a little tale about Tid. Have you? But I'm going to let you go for the match results first. Okay. So, Wednesday's match, 118, John Taylor, 12 ounce, Ian Benton, 3.5 ounce. Andy, too good, one and a half ounce. Um, so, yeah, not not very good. Wednesday? Yeah. Do you remember what the weather was like? Uh, this Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, it was not too bad and we had a bit of rain. It was horrible. You were practising. Yeah. And I went out off there. Yeah. And within an hour, well, within half an hour, little legs was back inside cold. Yeah. That wind was... you. You had it on your backs. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was... It was in your face as well. It yeah, was weird. It, it, was... it didn't feel like a good day to be fishing. No. Well, there's plenty of fish about. <laughs> as always. But, anyway, yeah. sorry. I've interrupted. Sunday. Sunday. Back down Main Road again. You know, that they're persevering with it. The man, Concrete Kilby or MPEG Kilby. Or Big Fish Kilby. Or Big Fish Kilby. Whichever hat he puts on. Um, eleven pound two all roach. Yeah. Second was Steve Barrett seven seven. And Mike Smith six thirteen, and then Mister Kipling was fourth with six pound seven. All little fish. All roach. Yeah. Little things. Now I had an appointment in Boston on Thursday. Boston. Boston. Oh, that was nice for you. So I thought to myself, when I saw the Wednesday results, mm-hmm. I thought, I, this is this something, I need, I've got to do something just to put my mind at rest. Mm-hmm. So I got, rather, I was driving to Boston and I thought, I'm going to get up really early and I'm going to walk along Main Road. And if you, Main Road's brilliant for fish spotting yep. first thing in the morning, but yep. you've got to do it just as it's getting light. Mm-hmm. If you leave it an hour into daylight, it looks dead as a dodo. And the, there was no wind, which is, you have to have a really, really calm day. Mm-hmm. And I walked along this stretch, and peg six and seven, far shelf, there were little things dimpling. And I thought, there are fish here. Mm-hmm. And peg nine and ten, slightly bigger fish. But they were really isolated. Mm-hmm. They weren't doing it anywhere else on the stretch. It was yeah. really interesting. And I thought to myself... There are fish here, but they're in pockets. Mm-hmm. And then, guess what I saw fly overhead? Cormorant. Black death. Mm-hmm. And there's only one, but I scared it off because it obviously wasn't going to land with a human being there. But I thought that was quite interesting. And then 
So I saw the Wednesday results. I thought, this is strange. What is it? So Thursday morning, spent about an hour down there. Took a flask with me, just sat. There's a mm-hmm. bench, isn't there? Is it Jockey's bench? Yeah, Jockey, yeah, yeah. yeah. Peg 11. 11 or 12? Uh, 13, I think. Right, 13 so. 13 or 14. There were no fish near that bench. It was all Peg 9 and 10. Mm-hmm. And 7 and 6, I think. But really interesting, they were localised. There weren't a lot of them, but they were dimpling. And then, obviously, once the sun comes up, mm-hmm. gone. But I don't know what pegs they caught off from on Sunday, but I bet you they weren't a million miles away. And I bet you they were really isolated pockets of fish. There are some silvers there, but they're the little runty things. I don't yeah. know where the big ones... Well, I know what's happened to the bigger ones. Mm. Mm. And this is my worry for North Level with the matches being cancelled. Because these guys are brilliant. They go down on Wednesday yeah. and Sunday and they keep going. Because the well, matches are cancelled, the cormorants will home in because I, I saw one. So if the guy, if you can go pleasure fishing, go to Main Road. Mm-hmm. Keep the cormorants off. Yeah. Have a go for the tench. You get a mile Well, this spell. is another prime example of the Fen and Guardian scheme, obviously, where it comes into effect, isn't it? You know, dog walkers. Yeah. And, not just anglers that are going to be about because of the lockdown. They're seeing stuff that shouldn't be going on or anything that looks suspicious. And um, well, that's right. More eyes on the bank, the better, isn't the it? Last lockdown, we yeah. had Ma- May. May, excuse the pun, was mayhem. Yeah. I've got a message from one environment agency. I won't say who it is. Mm. Worker, and I've never met this person, but he blatantly put a message out on Facebook that they had over 100 calls, incidents, in one week. Because Man. people just took advantage of the situation. So you're right, Alex. If people can just get out there, do a bit of fishing, take the dog for a walk, get out on the riverbanks. I was going to scare the cormorants off, but we've got to move them off. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will take... They will actually home in on areas without human beings being there. Mm-hmm. But sadly, keep an eye out on what humans are up to as yeah. well, because... I think we are going to have a few problems in the next month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wasn't going to get onto that, but you, you're right. Anyway, North Level, wasn't it great to see £11 win it? Yeah. You, I think you'll find the weights will get a bit better now. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I think they will. Yeah. So, obviously, that was tid good, as they say. Um, Whittlesea Saturday series, another good attendance. And they went back to the... Disable pegs or over twenty guys again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not serious money. They're all there for the laugh and just a day's fishing, really. Um, top dog was Dave Moisey with ten eleven. He was on the disable platforms at Wilsey Dyke. Jeff Tuttleby drew the culvert peg, which is a very frustrating peg. I've drawn it myself, and uh, one minute it's perfect and you're getting a fisher chuck, and then the next minute this culvert just goes. Oh no! And you ca- you can't get a bite, or you're fishing next to your keep net, and then all of a sudden it slows down, and then it's going left, right. It's it's proper weird pegged fish. Um, Is it one of those uh, like mercury tilt switches yes, in it, the drain? It does. Yeah, yeah. So like this little board opens up, and yeah. a load of water comes in, and then it stops, and then it. Oh, it's completely random. Yeah. Yeah. There's no pattern to it. No. It's not like you can go oh, another minute, and it's going to wash out again. It's completely random. So. He had 9.14. Mel Saggers was third, £9.6. And fourth was Arthur Small with 8.15. So not your standard big weights on the drains, but a close competitive match. Um, he does it continental style as well. So the pegs between the sluice and the railway bridge are normally the ones to draw, or the sable pegs. And the pegs the other side of the bridge, normally the further you go away from the bridge, the worse they get. Um, like Isn't that a great drains. idea? Yeah, it just keeps everyone happy. Does, I mean, yeah. something we've done at the fishery, obviously when we're using two or three lakes, we do continental payout. And I think once people get the gist of how it works um, and that it's the best way, it, it's really straightforward and it's good. It is good. You I, know. When you first explained it to me last year on the podcast, yeah. I sat there and thought, that's actually really good because you know... You know some lakes some lakes or some areas of the drain are gonna be better than others. Yeah. But it keeps everyone interested. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's a really fair way of doing it. Yeah. Um so that's what we'll see. Um so next club we'll move on to is St Neats. Obviously we've not we've not really covered St Neats a lot, but I think we hopefully will throughout this series of the podcast. Um 
they're a great friendly club. A lot of the anglers come in the shop, and there's they've got lots of new anglers again. The money's not big. They're there for the enjoyment. Um, they got a lot of youngsters fishing as well, which is brilliant. Um, so good on them, really. I mean, the clubs come from literally nowhere in four years, and it's really really encouraging to see. Um, and this week's winner was Carol Brown with thirteen pound eight. I think they was on the regatta field this week. I'm not too hot on the use at St. Neitz. Um Obviously, I get to hear all the places, but I don't know the. Yeah. You know, when you can't get a picture in yeah. your head because you've not been there and stuff. But um, thirteen pound eight. I think Carol had free bream on the feeder. On the feeder, yeah. yeah. I read Obviously, that. it's one of the only proper rivers we've got really, as such. And rain and colour equals bream, doesn't it? Yeah. In certain areas, runner up was Stephen Waller. I know it's the first time he's fished there. He actually asked me for some information and. Um, I said, look, mate, I said, I'm not really that clued up on um, on St. Neat's waters, but um, pointed in the right direction for Chunky. And um, he, he fishes all the matches on there. And obviously it's paid off and he's at 8.13 for second. And then Dave Hennessy was third with 2.12. So I think the roach and that were hard to catch, but what fish were there were decent fish. It's really good that we're getting new clubs, getting contact yeah. with us for the results. And... It- the kids getting youngsters involved. I think next year, once we get through this COVID crap, Mm -hmm. we can get back to some form of normality. And I think we need to have a real big push on the day, the piddly day that you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think somehow, and this is where the Angan Trust need to help out, being a school teacher, we've got to get away from this overly child protection stuff. It just scares everyone rigid to take kids fishing yeah and what it does it it throws the balance too far that way mm-hmm. now i think i'm quite um uh qualified to talk about this because i spent a long time well you'll know as a head of year i spent yeah. a long time working with child protection cases and the police and multi-agencies yeah. and i know how important it is however it's got to a point whereby it just scares the living daylights out of people yeah. angling clubs to take kids fishing yeah and when we're, we're ruining our future because mm-hmm. we haven't got the youngsters coming through. And um, I'll tell you what other thing I was doing. I was YouTube. Mm-hmm. Amazing. There's young two young lads called Carl and Alex, their brothers. Mm-hmm. They've got like 230,000 subscribers. I think they're now probably the biggest fishing YouTube channel in the UK. Right. And these guys are brilliant because they just go fishing. Mm-hmm. And it's a bit carp orientated. But youngsters love it. They, mm-hmm. They're a bit bit trendy, you know, yeah, me and yeah. you, well, not you, but me looking at it going, yeah, I kind of get some, it's just, they, they base it, at, they're only yeah. young, at 20s, I mm-hmm. think one's 19, 20, everyone's four years older, they just go fishing, and mm-hmm. I think that's the way forward with this, we need to be able to hook, excuse the pun, these youngsters in, get these angling clubs to feel that they're safe having them on board, mm. and I think it'd be quite nice if we can do something next year, once we, like I said, get past the COVID, yeah. and I, it just needs to be a little bit more user friendly for clubs to get on board and do this. So for St Ives to, no St St Neots. Yeah. Sorry, I get so I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> for St Neots to be pushing this, I think it's brilliant because I think yeah. it just scare. But even people. even um, St Ives, are, you know, obviously with COVID and that, there's a lot of anglers coming into fishing. You know what they're doing with access to pegs and stuff like that. It's brilliant to it see. Is, yeah, it is really good. But I think we I need mean, to be a bit brave in the sport and go, look, come on, we've got to make it more accessible. Now's the, the time as well with obviously what's gone on this year. That yeah. There's no better time for kids to go fishing. Um, I mean, last week was obviously half term and um, I didn't realise it was half term. And on Monday about nine o'clock, it was as if like the school bus turned up. It was brilliant. All yeah. with their parents, you know, two concessions and one full ticket, mate, please. Yeah, they are. And it, it was like, wow, look at all these kids. Never, ever in October half term have we had that amount of kids do you fishing. Think, do you think that's because the parents got back into it because of the first Possibly, lockdown? yeah, possibly. Um, and a lot of them were new to the fishery this year. And, um, yeah, just mums bringing their kids as well, not just dads, you know. 
Um, Because one one idea we had, which we didn't get time to do, was have these starter packs, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So everything just come a bit too quick, didn't it? I think we need to get organised early. Yeah. And we'll do a bit of um, pushing on this on the podcast, on the YouTube channel. Yeah. And what we're going to try and do is basically get, I think we're trying to have a limit of about 100 quid, weren't we? Yeah. If it's possible. Yeah. Just get it... The basic stuff. Basics, po- yeah, the, pole the setups stuff. or a yeah. float setup or yeah. a feeder setup or even a combination. Yeah. And just get people fishing. They don't need to have a real smart box. No. They can sit on a, a garden chair, can't they? Mm-hmm. But it's just getting them out there and going. Mm-hmm. And I think I think commercials have got a big part to play in this yeah. because um, it's a really good way to get people into it. That's why I used to bring the pupils down to your place, wasn't it? Yeah. Because they yeah. catch. And it's yeah. safe. You it's, can see um, everybody. It's hard to get young wranglers into match fishing nowadays i think it's not cool it's not trendy whereas obviously specimen carp fishing is a bit more you know <sighs> look at my rods and buzzers yeah it's a bit I'm you know and, and the problem is is they need to know watercraft before they can yeah you know well some people just naturally instinct do well straight away don't they and others yeah. you can see that then they're, they're not quite grasped it but yeah, it'd be um, it's great to see. All, last week, all the kids coming down to your place with parents. Yeah, because yeah, it's really yeah, it's the breakdown of the family, the modern family unit, which has meant we've got this yeah. this issue. But I just think maybe common sense might start kicking in after COVID with lots of things. And I think yeah, trying to get angling clubs to feel more comfortable doing this because it just seems to have stopped. And I don't blame anybody. Oh, mm-hmm. I would be scared stiff to have a junior section mm-hmm. in the current climate. Yeah, it would be like what and all these regulations you have to jump through understand it obviously because i've i've seen it to mm. death but um I mean, maybe even obviously with the river we, we've got here there's no better venue to promote angling for juniors is there really well i won't take Leighton to your place no because i said we know what we're going to catch yeah we what out. i mean is that i can remember fishing as a junior seven years old fishing the Monday night March and District AA junior matches. But you never know what you're going to catch out here. No, a, no. Rivers and, are brilliant. When it was at, say, Morton's Lean, there'd be 10 and 11. Yeah. But when it was at West End Park, there might have been 20 because it's easy for parents to drop them off. It's easy for people to stay, you know. Um, so definitely when this COVID thing's going, it's sort of maybe just do one every two weeks or just, I don't know, just to get a few... Kids what, you want to do a junior com- fishing? Like competitive, yeah. I don't, obviously not every week, but I think every other week or something like that. Just once you get the kids competing against each other, that's, you know, that's yeah. what they want, don't they? Well, we could for do me, it's all about competing. And, you know, when I've done coaching and stuff like that with um, at the fishery, it's always helped if the parents there and... and the kid it's like right we'll have a little match now me and you against your dad and or your mum or whatever first to five and you can see straight away there's a, like a I don't know there's that instinct to to concentrate a bit more and they understand things a bit quicker like no, right you're totally right do you know what I mean do you know what I found when I took the pupils fishing if the parents hung about mm-hmm. the pupils never fished properly mm-hmm. as soon as the parents went they tried different things. Mm-hmm. It was the weirdest thing ever. It was as though they were... So I used to say, why are you doing that? Well, uh, this is how Dad set me up. Dad might not have been an angler. And you mm-hmm. go, oh. <laughs> what? As soon as the parents go, they go, so how do I do this? So you, you tie them up, they go, this is how you do it, Prof. They went, I thought that was... And you know what I mean? Yeah. And they start doing it. Yeah. And uh, take one last thing. It takes me back to when I was really small. I must have been about 11. Well Creek. They used to have, it was Beach and District Angling Association. So the, mm-hmm. the club yeah. used to hold uh, junior matches on a Wednesday night on the Well Creek at Outwell. And I, was, I, could have, I must have been 11, 12. Dad would just drop me off and you're there with all the kids. Mm. This is how it was. And I think the first match I went in, he picked me up. It was getting dark because it was mm. midweek. And I sat on the side of the road waiting for him with my gear. Big trophy. <laughs> Whose is that? This is mine. What? Didn't have a clue. Mm. I fluked a tench, won the match. But it's these memories that stick mm. in your head forever, isn't it? And that sort of thing would have completely transformed and I was totally besotted with the sport mm. because I'm sitting there, little porcupine quill, probably catching two or three little roach or perch. 
fluked the tench, won the match, and then you, that's it. Yeah, you're in, aren't you? Mm. And it's sort of one of those memories in life that will stay with you forever. But that's how it used to be. And do you know what? Statistically, we live in the safest times ever. Do you know why people think it's not safe? These things. Mm -hmm. Everybody videos and photographs everything. So every smallest incident gets reported. Whereas 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. wasn't the case. And 20 years before that certainly wasn't the case. But statistically, we live in the safest times ever. But everyone's scared to go outside and do something. Mm. It's crazy. Right, anyway, now we've put the world to right on that one. Next club. (laughs) Next club. So, Hull Beach were at Sharps Bridge, obviously on South Holland. Uh, Andy Goodyear, top rod with £14.2. Chris Newton, 10 11 Ronnie Newton, 9 12 Gary Boxall, £9.5. So, normally the fish like a tid are migrating further and further and further into the narrower stretches. But there's a few fish holding up at Sharps Bridge. Um some fantastic fishing on on Hull Beach water this year, aren't they? Really, yeah. It's getting uh, see some great pleasure catches as well. It's getting so better and better. Maybe one of those venues to try in lockdown, um, just somewhere new. You know, this it's good good time now. with no matches and that to perhaps go and do something a bit different. You know, I know I should probably have a at least one out in on the river cam. I enjoy trying to catch a few chub, and it's just something different from the normal yeah. hustle and you know, frantic match fishing, really. So let's definitely uh, have a go at that. Well, if we can get back into the swing of things in a month's time, you boys yeah. are going to be refreshed, recharged, and ready yeah. to go again. It, yeah, so there are, there are positives, aren't there? Definitely. But it's nice to see the South Holland coming back. For those that don't know, this drain has been absolutely destroyed over the last 30, 40 years with saltwater incursion. Mm-hmm. And how these fish come back is incredible. But um, it used to have huge bream shoals in there. And I don't know if the big bream shoals are making a comeback, whether the carp, which never used to be in there, which have kind of like the last eight, ten years or taken a stronghold, are going to impinge on that. I don't know. But mm, you see how it balances out, yeah, won't we? Yeah, time will tell. But it's always produced some really nice roach fishing. Normally when there's a few carp introduced into, a, say, a natural park, like the bream and that tend to have a big spurt don't they with the fish meal and stuff like that's been fed but we'll see won't we yeah we'll see i remember years ago seeing a dead carp on a you know the old fertilizer bags yeah it covered it really yeah there's a really old tackle shop is it jed's jez's yeah, in the whole beach yeah what's it called jed's it's got a picture of it really yeah but this is 20 years ago he yeah. showed me it and he said I said, that's, that's where that come from? He went, yeah, South Holland, found dead. It must have been a monster. And there's some nice fish in there, isn't there? Yeah. Beautiful yeah. fish. But um, I think that would have perished with the, the last big hit, but they are there or thereabouts, which is great. Mm. Mm. Right, Ramsey. So the midweek one, as always, is at St Mary's. Um, you have to be a club member to fish the midweek matches. I think a book's 15 quid, and I think concessions about fiver for the year so you can't get any cheaper than that really uh, again no serious money paid out so it's not like you're fishing for a row of houses or anything just park behind your peg nice comfortable fishing uh, Wednesday's winner was your man on fire Ivan Steels with £17 seems to be sort of the weight at the minute at St Mary's uh, Jeff Tuttle will be second 16 13 Malk Hobbs 16 11 Danny Needham, 15.11, and Steve Stones, 15.8. So, Ooh. close. Yeah. And that's all small fish up to sort of four ounces. That's a nice match, isn't it? It is. It is. Lovely fishing down there. I would say hemp fishing, bit of cast fishing. You can do a bit of everything, really. Chuck a waggler, all sorts. So. You'll be down there after Christmas, won't you, midweek? Well, I might even go this week, actually. It might be my last chance to fish a match for a while. <laughs> so, I may go down there and... Have a day's fishing. And then Sunday, um, match winner was a certain Tim Bates. No way. The old man, yeah. What, you let him out of the shop? Yeah, he's always he's always fishing on a weekend. He fishes more than me. And he's had 17-12, all on casters. Um, sort of 
five, six metres and eight metres. A few fish on hemp, a few perch on worms. But again, 17, 12. I think it was about peg four. He's a bit of a dark horse, isn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. always, he gets yeah. a sneaky win in every now and again. He does, yeah. Yeah. Gets his confidence up, so it's good. Um, nor is then the other Kilby, and he's definitely an MPEG specialist, Paul Kilby. He's had 13, 14. Is he the original NPEG Kilby? Yeah, really, yeah, 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 yeah. And then third was your man Ivan Steels again with £11.5. So a little bit lower weights on Sunday, but still exceptional fishing. So um, there's one there this Wednesday. Obviously, that might be your last chance to get a match for a little while. So let's just do a little recap, a guesstimate. We've met, how many ma- ma- how many club matches have you mentioned? Five. Yeah, yeah. I reckon you're talking about probably about seventy, eighty anglers. Yeah, probably more than that. I would yeah, have thought. Which yeah, which is really healthy considering we had the big match on Sunday as well here. Yeah. The match fishing scene locally is really good, isn't it? It's definitely, on natural venues, it's definitely had a resurgence, yeah. yeah it's lovely. Definitely. It's really good. And it's, um, considering how much hammer the drains have had from all sorts mm. of predation and legal fish removal, I think it's amazing how they are still responding. And it's great mm. that we have all these guys and ladies out and about yeah. and angling. I think it's mm. really cool. I mean, obviously, there's the, the Boston Winter League as well. That's making a bit of a comeback for quite a long, probably four or five years. Um, that hasn't been running. But last year and this year, they've run an individual league and they're sort of thinking they've got 25, 30 people fishing, which is good as well. Um, I think on the Bargut, as they say around there, not Bargate, on the Bargut bar drain, um, NPEG won it with like 40-odd pound. Really? Tension, a few bream. I think and, um, and one of the RAF lads went down there in the week and caught an absolute rake of tench. I saw that. Yeah. 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 I think it was Richie Tamara went down there and had a nice day. So, again, good to see the mm. the Boston drains coming back. Do you think the drains are fishing really well because of the amount of anglers that are on it I as think well? it has a big effect, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Because I remember back in the day... These fish were so t- tuned into naturals that mm. it took a while yeah. on certain stretches to get them I going. Think, I think the reason why it, more people are realising the potential of, of the drains and rivers in the area, and they're seeing sort of, well, with social media, for example, you know, it, it helps everyone's business, doesn't it? Yeah. And... People are going, God, look what you caught out there. Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? And even if you're not necessarily a keen match angler, you you know, you perhaps follow this podcast because you want to find out what venues are fishing. So you go down in the week and yes. catch a load of roach or, yeah. you know, everyone gets out of it what they want. But it's definitely the more people fishing, the more fish are going to be caught. As simple as that. I just think it's brilliant. I just think... The more I get into doing like this, the Fender Guardian scheme, mm-hmm. you don't realise how many people are out and about, not no. just anglers. And there's so many no. people like sharing the environment. Yeah. I just think it's really good that it just seems to be blossoming, doesn't yeah. it? And the amount of match anglers that are now coming back into the sport, getting reinvigorated yeah. by it, or you know, like it's it, it's not. You know, in some sports, you think, oh, the average age is like it's fifty five, sixty. I think there's a chance for anglers to have a massive reassurance. reassurance Resurgence. <laughs> Resurgence. That's the word over the next few years because I think if we can get the Definitely. kids coming through, I think it's just lift off. Really, it's yeah. really it's, it's it's great. Yeah. Right. So, thank you for all the uh, the clubs that got in touch with Alex with that. Yep. And Alex has obviously been busy trolling through Facebook as well and pulling off the results. Yeah. If there are any other clubs out there who would like us to publicise your matches, obviously that's going to be now after the beginning of December. Please get in touch with us. And we will do our best to do that. Right, buddy. I think it's time to get into the... Winter League. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start off with the results and then we'll go into what you did? Um, or do you want to do what you did and then go into yeah, the results? Yeah, I think we'll start off with the results because obviously that's what stands out the most. It's um, we all the, the pegging was slightly different from the week before. So they dropped, which A and B sections was 
low numbers through the narrows up to sort of the Wigston's Bridge. That was pretty pants last week. So they've put an extra section above the bypass this week. Excuse me. And then they also put some extra pegs behind the swimming pool. And basically there was a few pegs missed out the week before. So they've just basically put all the pegs in from behind the swimming pool all the way up to the bypass. Do you know what I really liked about the match report? Under each picture they explained which section it was. Yeah, that was that was me that did that. Oh, was it you? Yeah. Oh that that was I didn't realise. Yeah. <laughs> oh it was right, well that was really helpful because yeah. I was looking going, B section. B was they're yeah, the, that's what it changes. Picks. That's yeah. the problem with March as well. You know, we fish March for whatever and we call the allotments and everyone's probably going, why is it called the allotments for? There ain't no allotments here. But over years, it, the town's changed, you know, so, but we still call it that. But I didn't realise you'd done that. That Well, <laughs> that sounds a bit cheesy, but it was really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, it was really helpful, yeah. Yeah. So we've got to start really with the winner. Wow. Um, B1, which was the end peg behind the swimming pool. Last year's end peg was a peg to the right of that on the concrete, but there's considerably a lot more boats down there, moored on the far bank now and seems to be on the inside. So I think that's another reason why the fish are shoaled in there so tightly. Um, there's people on them boats as well. So there is a few cormorants and stuff about, and I think obviously human activity stops all that. So... Um, we went for a practice in the week and it was absolutely jing jing clear I, it, I've never seen it that clear and the amount of rain we've had as well I don't understand why it's so clear I think probably the, the volume of weed in there is one of the reasons it's still running off wasn't it nicely yeah I mean in the actual match days where people get in and put platforms in and have chucked a weed rake and stuff the first hour and a half is quite coloured and then obviously when it's been flowing, it just takes all the colour out and it just goes crystal clear. And then fish just back off really quick. Normally you can catch for two hours down the middle, but these fish are just moving across. And that's why any peg with a bit more room and a feature and stuff like that is such a bonus to have. Um, and behind the swimming pool, it's one of the most sheltered. Um, and there's just millions of fish there. Um you could see these fish all sat there like soldiers, all next to this boat. A bit like how the 20 foot goes at the footbridge. Just thousands and thousands of them all lined up like sardines. Um, so we didn't sit on those pegs. We walked past them and went, oh, I wish I, one day I'll draw here, you know. Dream on type of thing. Um, someone's got to draw it. And a good friend of mine, Liam Darla, brown in hot rods, drew it. And... Uh, He's had sixty-five pound. That's amazing. Yeah, you know that's unreal fishing. Yeah, almost a bit silly. It's it's bordering on stupid. Do you know what I mean? It's I mean when you think you go to Ireland, if you catch twenty kilos, it's like forty pound. That's like a big weight. This is like a thirty kilo weight. You know, it's it's it, anywhere and of small skimmers and roach. It's pretty impressive. Um, the fish are probably averaging five to the pound, six to the pound. So, in five minutes, you can soon put a weight, a, a weight together. Um, I spoke to Liam this evening on my way home from work, and he's fished basically two lines all day and just fished big maggot on the hook. Real positive rigs. Big maggot. It's fed big red maggot. Yeah, you love that, don't you? Yeah. Um, fed um like four kilos of ground bait, three pints of pinkies, just really aggressive fishing. Um, so he's done amazing to catch 65 pounds. Do you know what I've realised? Those skimmers spread out mm -hmm. in the summer. Right. And as it gets colder and colder, they get tighter yeah. and tighter and tighter because you can't catch them out here now. Mm. But they love ground bait. Oh, they love food when there's that yeah, many of them. Yeah, you can chuck it on their heads and they'll keep coming. But yeah. obviously... The last yeah. two weeks, I've noticed that they haven't been out the front. And I bet you they're just really pulling in. Yeah. Interesting. I think the other thing as well, March has gone back to the old March where it would run all day, a nice steady pace. Whereas I think that's down to the volume of rain we've had the last two years. But before that, you could sit there and it'd stop. And then it'd back up and go the other way. And you never knew what March was going to do. But 
this year it seems to be more continuous. Um, got there in the morning, there was hardly any pace whatsoever. Uh, I weren't sure what, I mean, someone said, is it going to run? And I thought, I don't think it'll run today. Normally, if it's not running when you get there, it ain't going to run. Um, but how wrong was I? I mean, after about three hours, it was proper pushing. The wind was pushing it through harder than it actually was. And the leaves, God alive. Yeah. Wednesday, they were coming oh, at the trees. The only problem in March, again, that's yeah. the only negative about Liam's peg is as that many leaves get blown in there because of the wind and it's sheltered. When it doesn't flow, it's just like you can't get a rig in. No. But because but, it was yeah. flowing, there was, he could get a rig in. What he's done, that's an amazing is, capture. Yeah. And, and we did prophesize this a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? He said, yeah. I think it could do another match river yeah. record. And he's done really well to get that mm. way out. I mean, that section basically highlights March. Um, we said as a team, you need to draw one, two, and three. If you don't yeah. draw one, two, and three, you're fishing for fourth at best in section. And um, there was a £41, Craig oh. Nicholas. <laughs> £41 and you don't win it. Mad, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and you think what activity is, well, you've got kids running up and down, scooters, bikes, the path literally on your top kits. And there's these fish... That's where they feel safe. They don't so, care. They're not. No, put, they're not put off by human beings. Not right? at all. No. So I think they probably go there because there's humans. Um, so yeah, Barry Stacey had uh, thirty-one pound eight in those three pegs, but I think Dan Abbott was the only one to get in the frame that wasn't in that yeah. section. Yeah. Um, Rob Wright was second in the match with forty-nine pound eleven. Um, he's fished a mega match. He's a brilliant bagging angler. Which peg was he on? He was the peg with the big gap, so obviously you got the three behind the swimming pool or library, and then there's a big gap, and then he's the next one. Right. Uh, we call it like the there's like the bandstand there. There's a little you when people that know the river know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Um, and that section finished just above the slipway. Um, Is that the one on the far bank? Yeah, the yeah. old slipway. The old. The March lines, is it? It's got like a winch. That's it. I've mechanism. never ever, ever seen a boat. No, I don't even know how you get access to it. No, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, I've never ever seen a boat in all my life go up here. Um, so yeah, I think last, that's a lot of fish in a small area. <laughs> last in that section was like 23 pounds. Wow, um, that's fantasy drain fishing, isn't it? It is, but it sums it all up really. Because if, you, if you're not in those three pegs, you've got no chance. And literally, the section goes down in order the further you go away from peg one. And that's how some of the drains always fish. I'll tell you what will be really interesting. If we get a cold winter with a lot of water, yeah, even more fish are going to get pushed into the March section. Yeah. And all those well, fish can't go into one spot. It's, it's, there's going to be some really big weights from other areas as the, well. The other thing as well, with, with no matches in that, it's not going to get nowhere near as much pressure as it normally does. So normally after Christmas, it gets hammered. You know, everyone's coming down practicing and the fish don't they spread out more, I think, but they just become a bit harder to catch and a bit more wiser and, conditions have to be right but um it's i think it could be a blessing in disguise for the river you know get a little bit of a break it um, could do another massive weight again couldn't it could do yeah Around but Christmas i think time. this time of year now is sort of optimum time for yeah. them skimmers, skimmers before they sort of shut up and then they get a bit selective when they feed but there's there's a lot of roach in the river but i, I think there's still more to migrate in there yet i think when this right. cold weather yeah. comes um because what are in there are good stamp. There's none of the smaller little roach that probably migrate a bit more. I don't know, but we'll see, won't we? I think you're right. I just think it's we'll going to get better and better. And there's other sections as well. The other thing is those weights there, and apart from the bypass section, none of them are rud. Normally the bigger weights at March have always been dominated by a few big rud or lots of like three to four ounce rud, but there was hardly any rud caught um, in this match. So it's interesting. It is. They're there. Yeah, they're there. They're definitely there. So, yeah, that is crazy. Uh, so sixty-five pound first, forty. Yep. Forty-nine pound was oh, second. Forty-nine second. Forty-one yeah. third. Mister Second Rob Wright, that's what we're calling him. Um. Yeah. So Gobberad forty-nine eleven, 
Craig Nicholas, 41.15. Then Dan Abbott was next from D1. So he is basically near your garden, the next peg above your garden on the opposite bank. So you've got plenty of room below. He's had 34 exactly. He's had a load of roach and skimmers, and he's had a bonus £4 bream as well. Thank you very much. Just the job. I know why that's there. Yeah. Yeah. That's all my pre-bait has gone in. Yeah, probably. I'll stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> Barry Stacey was last in with £31.8. That's amazing. So I'm just going through the sections. So um, the lowest section winning weight out of the whole match was myself with £17.6. I know where I found you Saturday. You said you were in A. So A, I was at which Wigston's. Wigston's. Yeah. And you wanted to get a bit, that little area between the culvert and... Well, normally Wigston's is another month's time. That's when you want to draw Wiggy's Bridge because the roach are in there. Normally, that match, the November-March Open, is the one where you want to be at Wiggy's. And um, last week... There was some couple of decent weights, but the weights weren't what they should be compared to the rest of the river. Yeah. We'll talk about your match in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, uh, sorry, that's me. I'll keep stopping you. Yeah. So um, it's not really the place to be at the minute. But there's, I won mine with seventeen six. Um, there's a twenty nine pound, twenty six pound, twenty nine pound, twenty two pound, eighteen eight, twenty pound fourteen, twenty pound seven, twenty two pound nine, twenty five pound ten. So they're all the section winning weights in every eight pegs. Um, as a team, it's laughable really. Our lowest weight was fifteen pound out of in our ten anglers in the whole match. Two years ago, yeah, I added up roughly, yeah, the I, I worked out. I was a bit sad really. Well, I, I worked out there was like over tons, tons of fish caught. Yeah, well, we, what will happen is these results get put into an Excel spreadsheet um, that Roy Winkup does does a brilliant job with. I mean, he doesn't fish the league anymore, but he gets all the results, puts them all in Excel. You can see who's leading the Stacey Cup, which is the individual uh, graph of the weights, cumulative points. It's brilliant. It does a great job. And there at the bottom, it gives you an average. I know that... Um, at Benick, the average was like nine pound £9. fourteen in eight, for eighty anglers, and that's at Benick. So, I would say the average for this match is going to be probably eighteen pound. I would have thought. <laughs> that's mad, isn't it? That is crazy fishing. Um, unbelievable! It's not even cold yet. And here we go. Right, this is a question that's going to be impossible to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Right. I, I just sit there and think, what percentage of fish in the swim did people actually catch? Don't know. It's a, we start to think about it, it's, it's, it's a bit scary, doesn't it's it? It's mad when you can see the bottom where you're fishing, yet you can't see a fish until you hook one. Yeah, and they flash. Just see the one that flashes, you don't see yeah. any other fish move, just a two ounce roach flashes when you strike, yeah. sit back, and you go in again, lay your rig in, and it goes under every single chuck, and it's like, man, how many fish are there, but you can't see any of them. I don't wish to sound like I said I told you so, but wasn't I saying all summer it was rammed full of fish? Yeah. And I kept putting the GoPro down and video and the video. I kept just getting some. What we've been doing here is just saving up mm. stale bread, ch chow mein, yeah. left anything mm. that's fish edible, chuck it off the mooring, mm -hmm. literally just dump it in, leave it 10 minutes with the GoPro down. The amount of fish that move in is scary. It's frightening, isn't it? It is, and I just think. That's such a healthy river. I'll tell you what the sad thing is, Alex, from my predator hat on. Yeah. This, you're not getting trouble from any jack pike, are you? Um, I, they're definitely there. They're there, but they're just not... How can I put it? I, I, whether there's that many fish there, ones we're catching isn't a problem. Uh, I mean, I spoke to Liam and he said I had a pike in my peg all day. You could see it chase a fish every time I hooked one. He said, but it never took any off the hook. But that's a rep. They would get, little jacks would get stimulated by all that activity. Right. And you'd be, I know you don't remember, but I used to come down here years ago yeah. and your dad was fishing these opens there. Yeah. And the, the anglers used to really complain about the jacks. 
right. hitting the baits, uh, the, uh, lifting off the fish and everything. They're just not there. It's no. it's it's good and bad. Um, if we can get on top of this illegal fish removal, mm. there are some places in the fens over the next five years are going to produce some phenomenal predator fishing. Mm-hmm. I'm amazed bigger perch haven't come out. There's definitely a lot of little perch. There's a lot of little perch, yeah. There's a lot of little perch again, but they're in areas where there's no roach. Yeah. Well, less roach, because there's definitely roach there. I've got a brilliant video. Right, right. It looks like Catching Nemo or something. Right. And um, again, off the deck in, yeah. you suddenly see a little perch, and it must be about an inch long, mm-hmm. and about 50 of them follow it. And they're just all in unison, swimming together, and they turn and come back yeah. the other way. It looks beautiful. But um, yeah, there's loads of little things in there. But mm. I know... Uh, one of the guys had a perch about three pound, didn't they? Back end of last season, yeah. William matches. Yeah. It just feels prime for doing big perch, but mm. you guys would catch them if they were there. You think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, you think so. Chop worm line. Yeah, just putting I mean, putting in maggots, get them going. Mm. I catch them off the deck in spewing up red maggots, but they're not very big. The biggest one we've had is about six ounces. Yeah, yeah. Very rarely do you see one over sort of eight, ten ounces yeah. on there. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, the bypass can hold some. I know Bob was trying to add a few, like, pound, pound and a half on the weekend, but that fish brilliant. You know, first time that's been in for a long while. They put seven pegs, started all above the turning bay on the boats. Like lowest weight was about 16 pounds, something like that. Wow. Top weight was 25. What a magic little river. Yeah, and it was different fishing up there. It's like one side of the bridge is all, not tech, technical fishing, but more sort of, two lines just roach fishing and above it's sort of, it was take your brain out and catch 350 fish for 25 pounds so it's mad and most of them were little rut yeah it yeah it's mad how it goes like that but um it'd be phenomenal. nice be nice to get a few more bonus tench popping up wouldn't it just a yeah i think there was an odd one caught was on there pinky rigs and stuff because yeah. obviously you haven't got time to sit there and try and catch a bonus fish because it's all about catching roach. And I've skins. caught one this summer. Have you? The only one. Yeah. yeah. It, was only about, it was like an old warrior, about two and a half pounds. It was yeah, they, battered. You don't get them big, like 20 foot tench no. in there. They're just little resident ones that are yeah. like a couple of pounds. And you, if, if, you can normally get them in on light tackle, especially when the weeds are gone anyway. Yeah. I think it's a magic little river. It is it, unbelievable. It is, yeah. it is unbelievable. Just, it's missing a bit of a balance. Yeah, but, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, but it might come back. We never know. Anyway, right. I know a few people want you to explain what you did. Right. So. Um, well, normally at March, I, I try and keep it very sim- simple, to be honest. And I don't put too much in at the start. I sort of get a feel for things before changing, adapting my match to how the river is fishing. Um, but I haven't been at Wiggies for quite a while and I've never fished it this time of year to be honest so um, a few of the lads fished it like practicing a couple of weeks back before like the Friday before the practice match and they said there's a lot of little perch up there but it felt like how March fishes after Christmas when it's been more pressured so I sort of took that on board really Um, and to be honest I fished my first part of the match I fished wrong Um, We've sort of, with the, with the way the river's been fishing, we've sort of eliminated red because there's too many other fish to catch on pinkies and stuff. Because um, red can be a bit too selective sometimes. I think on the boss pegs where you're catching stamp roach and skimmers, then, you know, bread is perhaps the way to go, um, especially short. And um, so I started my match, fed my two balls, or two balls of ground with a few p- pinkies in it. Um, or as John Taylor says, laced with a few pinkies. Um, he's been fishing a lot of matches, hasn't he, lately? But we'll, we'll you come think? On. <laughs> <laughs> he's retired. <laughs> Fishes every day. Um, so put a couple of balls in down the middle and I put my usual pot of ember cross um, in like two foot of water. Um, bit of pace on it. So I thought it would be all right to start off. It started quite positive. On like a point eight rig, um, all my shot down gets down. And you're fishing quick. Uh, I tend to always put my ground bait slightly down my peg when there's flow because the fish are hungry. They'll come above it. 
So you don't want to put it in front of you and you're basically missing the fish when you're running it through. Um, so you think they're coming actually through it? Looking yeah, what more... happens is they get competitive and the, they come f- over your ground bait because there's that many of them and yeah. looking, for, they're like looking up. Yeah. Um, which I think that's another reason why March tends to be a loose feed venue, to be honest, because they're looking for it. It's yeah. not like... Um, so I started there and I think in the first hour I probably had 80 perch just fishing four and one um, dropping it in like like a blood run rig lowering it in holding it dropping it it's fishing within seconds and every time little dink whatever hook bait above my feed bottom of the feed I'm thinking what the hell where are all the roach gone what's gone wrong I'm sort of looking around me. Paul Wright was quite close to me on my right, so I could see exactly what he was catching. He was probably catching 20 perch and one roach. That was the ratio of what we were catching. It was the same for um, Tom Moretti on the MPEG. Um, what a shock. And then, <laughs> and, then, um, and then Richard Martin in between us, he started on the, um, on the pinky and he was catching a few perch on odd roach. And then he, he fed some bread. And um, I know Simon Smith was next to the bridge. He fed, started on bread as well. And they obviously never caught any perch. They weren't catching nowhere near as fast, but what fish they were catching were the right stamp. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. I'm fishing this completely wrong. Mm. So you think, well, I've got to make the best of a bad situation. So I just got my head down and caught as many perch because... When you catch 80 in an hour, you know what perch are like. You run out of fish. Literally, yes. you catch them all, yeah. and then that's it. So I'm thinking, hopefully I'll catch them all, and all that's left is the roach then. And after about, I don't know, 55 minutes, 50, 55 minutes, my inside line's dying. And you know it's dying because your bites are slower. You've had to top up. Did you borrow John Taylor's fish counter? No. You said you had 80 perch in the first R- hour. Roughly 80. You know, I had a lot of perch. A lot of perch. Um, and two a minute, like four and one, is is quick, but it's not like silly. Do you know what I mean? It's not like it's quite manageable. And um, I could feel it going, so the pace wasn't too bad there. So I started pinging a bit of hemp and a odd few squats long, and um, went over. And it was the same, just perch chat, perch chat. I'm pulling my hair out here, thinking, oh god. Please be some roach turn up. Well, they're about half ounce a piece, I should think. Yeah, they are. They're tiny, yeah. yeah. But you can catch them quick. So yeah. I thought if I can just keep in touch with a few roach feed, I yeah. can yeah. soon boost my weight up. Um, at this point, the, the lads on bread were still catching down the middle. And I'm thinking, well, no, this must be the only section in the whole match that bread is, is better than ground bait down the middle. And because of the perch, because there wasn't as many fish there. And I think that just sums up the way we fish March now. March, you know, 18, 20 pound would have been a good weight. And that's why bread was so good. Whereas now the weights are bigger. Bread isn't as fast. It isn't, there's more perch, there's skimmers and other fish to catch. So I think, you know, maybe that's why the bread isn't working like it used, uh, used to, but was dead right at Wiggy's. So... Didn't have the best of starts as such, weight-wise. Do you think wise. it works at Wiggies? Because there's a lot of people go over that bridge and feed the geese. No, I just think there's not as many roach there. Right. Um, whereas on the others, I think there's a lot of roach and there's a lot of other fish as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, you'll see there, another month's time, it'll all be ground bait and pinky because it's the stamp fish are there and they've just moved in there. Yeah. Um, so I started the match completely wrong. Um, Gone over, caught a few. The flow's just starting to pick up now. And I, I couldn't sort my loose feed in out. I weren't sure if it was a loose feed job, where it was what it was really. I was catching odd fish, little runs of fish, but it wasn't, I couldn't line them up properly. I changed a few of my rigs and um, you'd catch four or five and then you'd have to keep swapping. And yeah, you couldn't use a big hook, if you know what I mean. It ain't, mm you can smash them like you can up the other end because they're hungry fish and there's loads there. It was, I felt there's a few roach in my peg, but I was still catching perch. I'm thinking this ain't no good. And then a boat went through. Might have been a coincidence or whatever, or the pace picking up, but that boat went through and put a little bit more colour in. And within five minutes of the boat going through, my peg just transformed and 
instead of the fish being right down the bottom of the peg, they were right underneath my loose feed. They were like looking for it and they were hungry and they, they weren't big fish, but they weren't small. Do you know what I mean? They weren't like what you're catching behind the swimming pool. They're probably out to out to standard March fish. Yeah. And for I can keep these coming. I kept I couldn't settle, you know, I couldn't um line them up properly how I wanted and the pace got more and more and more and I thought this is too too pace, you know, even in that depth of water. So um just started cupping it and fishing it out. And it transformed my peg really. My peg just got stronger and stronger. Well, you now going back down the middle, were you? No, this is across. Still, still across. Uh, kept dropping in short. Nothing there. Really? Yeah. You once, think... the, once them fish, gone, mate. They're gone. Yeah. Um, it's hard to get them back down the middle. Um, and it's something that March has been like it for the last two or three years now. You used to be able to catch down the middle for quite a while when the bread was there, that worked. But now the fish are just backing off really quick. And um, I sort of messed about with putting a bit more longer line and because of the depth of water, I didn't want my pole tip too close to the fish when I was striking and trying to get um, trying to get that right, my elastics right, and couldn't really settle. Mm. Um, couldn't get yourself in a rhythm and confidence what well, you're doing. I could catch in a rhythm but not consistently yeah. Yeah. In, in the way that I needed to, you know, get back in, in contention to try and win the section. But... Um, sussed it out in the end and my peg was just getting stronger and stronger and stronger and I thought oh, and the pace dropped then so the, the, it's always changing your peg's always changing at March so you have to be in control of where the fish are in your peg um, even loose feeding it was right but you couldn't loose feed it too often because if you fed too much they backed off down your peg because it was too regular so they dropped down so you sort of have to loose feed it every four or five run through throughs sound right fenny then foo <laughs> run foos and then um you'd sort of feed it aggressively so it dropped down and then they're, they're coming up the peg looking for it and almost once that you'd catch a few under literally where you're putting your rig in you're sort of laying your rig in upstream holding it tight so it would sort of check your rig and then as it's just waiting up to go down you'd get your bite and you'd catch really quick then um so rig wise, I've sort of fished um, some floats that Richard Latimer's made for me. Um, very similar to a census basey, but instead of a hollow bristle, they're a cane bristle, so they're nice and buoyant. You can fish a nice little back shot. You can dot it down, but because of the body shape, it's like that teardrop shape on these drains. It's only shallow, so you can hold against that and just itch it through, if you know what I mean. Um, and then as the pace got a bit quicker, I went from a five per ten to a six per six per ten. So that's about I would say seven number tens and two ten droppers. Um there's a horrible skim on it as well, which made it difficult. One minute the wind was blowing your rig to the far bank, and then one minute it was the flow was trying to take you because you're sort of on a bit of a bend was trying to take it towards you. So you sort of had to get your rig in and put it through nicely to catch. Um, so end of the match, I know I felt I was playing catch up all day. Um, weren't I fished a decent match, but wasn't happy. I fished the wrong match, if you know what I mean. It made it hard work for myself. Yeah. Because I I didn't fish bread, but we haven't had to fish bread on March. So if I went back again, I'd definitely start on bread. Um, 50 50 bit of gravel and i think they would have come over it um so obviously they weighed the other three the other side of the bridge we weren't sure whether they were catching there's no bank runners there it was just one section on its own whereas i think obviously the other sections are all in a line so there was a bit more bank running up there so we didn't really know what was being caught the other side um i think there was a a nine and a couple of sevens or a seven and an eight the other side of the bridge which I felt that would be the side to be on, to be honest, because there's more room with the pace as well. The pace is all across. Hemp See, boat? Hemp boat, yeah. 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 So you like that, I'll get in the I'll, Yeah, I'll you know, now, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Simon Smith was on the bridge, uh, which was A4. He's weighed 12, 12 something or other. Uh, I thought he'd got a lot more than that, to be honest, because his fish look a lot stampier, but... When you're catching and you're trying to mm. in and out, and I thought, oh, I think I might have that. I thought, oh, I might have that. 
Um, as everyone knows, I, I'm not very good at guessing my weights. I really don't have a clue. But I thought, I think I got more than I had last week. And I had £11.12. I thought, I think I got more than 12. And then Paul Wright weighed in. Then I weighed in. And, I, you know, that buzz in it when you go to pick your net and you're like, yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that feels heavy enough. And um went seventeen six I think I had. So I was like I'm quite happy with that, but I don't think I beat Richard or Tom Moretti to my left. Um uh, Richard weighed sixteen nine and Tom weighed sixteen eleven. So it's tight match, just done enough. But you know when you've done enough, but you're not satisfied because you know you fished the wrong match. Yeah, you, you kind of got away with the skin of your teeth, and you felt you perhaps could have got another four or five pound out of there. Yeah, yeah, should should have. Yeah. But, but it's it's knowing, isn't it's it? It's knowing, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we never had any of the lads in that section in the practice match, so that that helps as well when you've yeah. got anglers spread across the venue um, because you get more of a yeah. That's great. Yeah, That's a really but, good rundown of what you did. Okay, so let's go to the, the team score then, because this was got this is where it got yeah, real interesting. Yeah. So we, obviously they've they've weighed in, and I've seen that I won the section. So you think oh, that's good, and your phone's pinging, the old WhatsApp and messengers pinging. We've all bored, and you're looking and like trying to pack away, but you're packing up because you're looking and finding out who's caught what. And I think the first five results we had back, we had four wins and a fourth. So I was like, this is all right. You know, this is this is good, this is. Um and then sort of another one comes in and then an odd dodgy one and then oh, you think, oh, what have we got? And I knew that the sections we'd done well in image had done well as well. So anyway, um turns out both teams had twenty nine points. But then when it's a tie it goes down to whoever has the most section wins, if that's a tie, section seconds, thirds and so on. Um obviously we had five section wins, so we knew that we'd beaten them with that um which sort of the result we want really um from the first round coming fourth a bit of a nightmare very close i think we had 39 points the first round and winners had 32 so although it's four seven points is nothing in this league no that's so it's crazy. a bit frustrating really about the first round and obviously we were second at bennick to image um, I mean, Image is still winning the league. They're still with they've got five points, but we're now second with seven. Sanjay's have eight, and I think Hot Rods have ten. So it's still really close, but obviously we don't know what's going to happen. Um, obviously matches are banned for the next four weeks f- for definite. Um, so how they do the rest of the league, I don't know. Probably a, they'll try and do three Sundays on the bounce or. We'll see. It's all up in the air at the minute. But we said at the start of the league, we'll do well to finish this league. And I think it's looking that way. Oh, it's, it's a, every time we get into this, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just amazed at how tight it always is. It's, it's mental. And the weights... Even on the accumulative score, the points are what they are. But I always look at the accumulative score and it's like, it's still only about, between us and Image, is six points. So six <coughs> section points on the whole oh, three rounds yeah. between us. That's how tight it is. And then Stan Jays are like two points behind us, say, and then Hot Rods are probably 12 or 15 points behind them. So it's so close. And that's why when we have these five section wins, I'm thinking, oh, oh this, this could be beneficial, this could. yeah, Because as it went to the last round last year, the accumulative score meant, obviously... Hot rods and image who comes second and who qualified for the final. That's right, yeah, it got ripped that so, time, didn't it? Yeah. You know, one even even when you come sixth in your section, it makes a big difference at the end of the league. It's so tight. That total commitment just to nudge up one place in your section. Yeah, it's team fishing. Yeah. It's think, team fishing, you know. It's the mindset's incredible and it's yeah. so tight and you've got so many good anglers mm-hmm. in that competition. I think it's fantastic because club level really healthy as we spoke about a while back and now at the next level up it's incredibly healthy you've got a lot of very good anglers pushing yep. each other and i just yep. think it's a, it's a credit to the local angling clubs because they feed into this and it's a credit yeah. to the organizers of this and the teams that go into this because you really put a lot of effort into it and um what a crazy set of results 
over the weekend from there. That lovely mm. little river. Brilliant. Mental. It's absolutely brilliant. Well, that's a fantastic match. And I, had, I just had a feel. I got actually <laughs> sadly excited last night to see the results. Mm. I say sadly because I just thought I knew mm. you guys were going to have a brilliant match, as in all of the competitors. Yeah. And when I saw the results, I was just blown away. I just thought that was amazing. I mean, the other thing as well, it's free fishing. Yes. I know it's free fishing. The, the only thing that lets it down, perhaps, as a venue is there's no permanent pegs, um, which might be the reason why it's such a good venue. Um, it's, you know, there's big gaps, there's boats, there's so many things that why fish live there and stuff like that. But I think that's what makes March. It is the fact that it doesn't get hammered as such like every single Sunday. It's not. It gets a little bit of a rest, and I don't know. It's just one of them unique, special venues, and yeah, it's quirky. Yeah, I think locally, as anglers, we appreciate it, but non-anglers don't actually realise. You know, they just think, "Oh, look, there's a bike in the river," and "Oh, how dirty the river is." They don't appreciate like what we do as anglers, how good the river is. I think the pubs do. I think yeah. the B and B places yeah. do, and the little yeah. hotels because they're income is still coming in in the winter which is vital for a local community so i think that side of thing they do but you're right the average Mm. member of the public doesn't realize how special this place is and they're not going to are they but um it'd be quite nice to uh i don't know publicize it a bit more to the well people of march you know let them know what they've got on their doorstep you know you might the dog walk because there's people always about yeah and it's, I mean, even to a certain extent, the people that live along there, it's the way of life in March. Soon as October comes, the river is full of anglers. And I think they realise that actually we're not doing any harm. We're enjoying what we do. And um, I think as you get new people moving into the area and they sort of straight away they think, oh, there's people fishing in my garden and stuff like that. And I think after a while they realise, well, actually, I've got to get used to this because this is what happens in this yeah. sleepy yeah. old market town of March. Everyone's got to learn to enjoy the river. Yeah. It's that simple. It's no one's, but it's everyone's. Yeah. And we've got to look after it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously there was there's talk of just platforms and stuff like that, but obviously COVID's put a stop to all that this year. Um, but if the access improves, it's... Phenomenal venue. It is, yeah. Yeah. Right, Alex, that's been fantastic. Is there anything you want to add before we finish? Um not really, mate, to be honest. Just obviously we're going in another lockdown now and just I think that we're lucky to be able to carry on fishing. I know for a lot of match anglers they won't go because it's not what they go they go for the competitive side of things. So it might be a good time to perhaps try something different style of fishing where it might be to take up your lure flinging or dead baiting for pike maybe or no 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 i no. don't want anyone else oh right no, no. you don't want a match angler to catch 30 pound pike do you that'd be like oh. well, they won't for one oh, they're, they're in mythical there. beasts <laughs> <laughs> you never know <laughs> but yeah i think um obviously as well Perhaps try new venues, you know, yeah, perhaps yeah. take a trip out to Holby. I think or... you're right. It's the, There's so much going on in these drains. I mean, yeah. It's four weeks of people can just, like you said, you're going to go on the cam, people go on the Holland, give it a go. Yeah. And, just try. and like I said, North Level, it's desperate for people to get down their main mm-hmm. road just to keep the bloody cormorants off and just, just keep an eye on mm-hmm. what's going on and just protect the environment. Can I just say one last thing? I meant to mention it earlier. Spoke to Cheesy Bob during the week. Not easy being cheesy. Not easy being cheesy. Loads of problems at Shepperson's. Right. Not just with the fly tipping yeah. that we mentioned earlier, but we've had fish traps, gill nets down mm-hmm. there. Bob, bless him, tries as hard as he can, but he's, he's at work. Mm-hmm. John Watson's down there a lot. We've got dog walkers down there keeping an eye on it. If anybody can help out keeping an eye on what's going down on Shepperson's mm-hmm. or any of the waters that we've got, like on the 20 foot, 16 foot middle level just let us know even march bypass you know that even though it's in the town it gets fished quite a bit that's another hot spot i had a guy message me this week he's moved into the area he said 
where can I help out? I said, would you go and be a guardian for that stretch? He went, no problem. Mm -hmm. You're right, upstream of the bypass is another big area we have problems with. Um, Gill nets there in the close season, out of season fishing. I found um, those fish in the little bag. We found fish traps down there as well. So this is going to be a problem time for the mm -hmm. area over the next three or four weeks as we head into another furlough scheme, which just releases people to do daft things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you can let me know, um, any help, even if it's just walking the dog for an hour a week, would be brilliant because... We just need to keep an eye on things. So sorry for a bit of a negative thing at the end, but I suppose it's a positive, really. Mm -hmm. Just trying to get everyone united with this front that we're producing. But Alex, if people have got any questions, to get in touch with you at the yeah, Tackle Shop. Definitely. And you can point them in the right direction. You've got the click and collect going on. Yeah, obviously got that. eBay's back on again now. And um, yeah, just give me a ring. We can put it all in a bag. Yep, drive through, pick drive it up. Drive through. Pick the, bait up, pick the maggots up from yep. the ground. Hopefully, bait. we'll have. We should, bait shouldn't be an issue either. I think yeah. the bait farm's carrying, carrying on producing bait, so that's not going to be an issue. Um, so, yeah. Just and you did, um, you had a trial run before, didn't you, in April and May? You know what you're doing there. You oh, yeah. 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 And I suppose also, next week, we're going to have to do it via phone. Exactly, yeah. We'll get round it, though. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's been brilliant. Thanks for coming around. Really appreciate it. Right, Lovely mate. to see you. Um, thanks for everybody that listens. Hope we haven't bored you too much this week, but I thought we'd give an extended one with the magnificent results from the yeah. Winter League. It was, it's worth it because that's quite a unique is, thing. Yeah. So if one or two people, have, we've rambled on a bit, I do apologise, but it's just phenomenal fishing. So it just leaves me to say to everybody, keep safe. Um, keep self-isolating we'll get through this together be a bit of a, a strange four weeks messages via um, lots of different ways you can do it via YouTube you can do it via the Tales on the Tackle Shop page and we'll try and answer people's questions by doing this and hopefully over the next four weeks we can keep people, everyone fishing with our inane ramblings on the podcast but that would be I don't know mm. it's pretty cool anyway mm. right that leads me to say this has been Tales on the Tackle Shop a Fenland Fishing TV production